Welcome to Brewed Awakenings, the podcast where we explore the world of coffee one cup at a time. I'm your host, Kevin Lee, and today we have a special treat in store for all our coffee enthusiasts out there. We are traveling to the lush and exotic island of Bali, where we will be chatting with the inspiring and talented Shay McNamara. Shay is the founder and mastermind behind the Expat Coffee Roasters, a specialty coffee company with a passion for connecting people through the love of coffee. He is the 2016 Australian Coffee in Good Spirits champion and has an unwavering dedication to creating exceptional coffee experiences. Expat Coffee Roasters are working hard to foster the Burgundy coffee and barista community of Bali by introducing the culture of making a good brew across the island one cup at a time. In today's episode, we'll dive into the fascinating journey of how Shea transformed his passion into a thriving business, exploring the differences of operating abroad, respecting religious diversity in business, bringing up a family in Bali, coffee brand expansion, and sustainability. So grab your favorite cup of joe, sit back, and join us as we embark on this caffeinated adventure with Shea McNamara of Expat Coffee Roasters, right here on Brood Awakenings. Hi Shea, how are you doing today, buddy? Hey, I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Thanks for tuning in from Bali. I appreciate your time, buddy. Man, my pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> we were just having a quick chat before, and I was like, I'm pretty sure I've met Shay back in Sydney sometime or in Australia, for definitely for sure. Very familiar face, but I'm excited to connect with him now. So yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> uh, years of competitions and judging, competing, all that sort of thing, as well as I think you had cafes in the in my local areas, so... I've definitely yeah. have been in for a brew, if nothing else. Yeah, for sure. Shay, for the listeners, let's get into a bit about your story. I wanted to, I know this is probably a long lifetime ago, but what were you, what was your previous life before you got into coffee? And then how did you get into it? <laughs> yeah, diapers and the preschool. <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> pretty much I was in high school. I developed a love for coffee. I didn't like to actually drinking coffee, didn't like the taste of coffee, but I loved the cafe environment a lot. So I used to go sit in cafes and I trained myself how to drink coffee. That was how it originally started. And then, and then when I was coming up to buying a car and all sorts of thing, and I needed to save some money. And so I got a job, the local pizzeria, the coffee rep came through, but some said, said he wants to learn how to make coffee. And that was my first real introduction to making coffee. And at 16, I was hooked ever since then, went to some more courses on coffee. Yeah. I tried to get out of it for a little while, spent about a year or so trying to have a bit more of a serious life in that office and behind a computer the whole time and found myself sitting in the cafe the whole time and watching what was happening, what they were doing with it, what people's orders were, how many customers they're serving for an hour, what are the additional buys they're doing and, and realized that I was much more interested in consumer behavior in a cafe than I was. Sitting in sitting in an office doing what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah. Natural curiosity for hospitality. Yeah, yeah. I can. I was. Uh, it's one of those things that I think when when you got it in your blood, it's just <laughs> very hard to uh, to not do it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, let's go into your journey about your coffee journey in Australia and then now in Bali. Yep. We after the pizzeria where it wasn't really it wasn't. I won't name names on what the coffee brand was or anything, but it wasn't a, a serious coffee outlet, but learning how to make it there and then understanding getting to know baristas while drinking coffee and understanding their journey, what they do, how they work. Got a little bit more interested, did a barista course, I took a barista course when I was maybe 17. And then by 18, I was doing a little bit of, bit more work behind, behind coffee bars and as I said, tried to get out for a little while, but then ended up getting a job with, with spotless catering. And mm. I worked in one of their busier, their business catering sites or their corporate catering sites. And uh, we were doing, took about maybe one and a half thousand cups a day in the cafe hours. Is. So it was a busy, busy espresso bar. Really got thrown in at the deep end from doing a little bit here or there in cafes right into doing double digit kilos per day and, uh, and frothing milk on the two liter jar. <laughs> <laughs> Fopping out cappuccinos through those. And, uh, wow. But yeah, it was a great, a, a great place to work where, you know, and after a little while, I started to learn a little bit more about coffee, doing more with Dow Edbergs at the time, was a coffee supplier for them and uh, with Piazza d'Oro. And I learned a little bit more through the coffee reps there and through the coffee, or the coffee professionals that worked within that organization and uh, developed a real passion and love for it where I ended up 
traveling and doing some things in between, but went back to, to Spotless as well, but ended up being a, the roving barista, I can't remember the exact title, but it was where I would actually go and I'd set up new cafes for them in the corporate mm -hmm. space. So I'd either set up cafes or if they were up for tender. So if there was a, one of the venues, like venues were up for tender, I'd make sure I'd go in there a little bit earlier, do some training, make sure the staff were all up to speed, make sure the quality's there, consistency's there, and uh, pour a few love hearts on the, on the, <laughs> on the, on the coffee back then, and then uh, try and win a tender through through love hearts and, and a little bit of tasty coffee. Yeah. yeah I did, did that for quite a number of years with Spotless Catering. That was a really enjoyable time. Through there, I also would go into sites that were run down or that were not not performing and see how we could fix them up. So what we could do to to get them up to speed. So it was great, great, great overview of a lot of hospitality venues from education, business catering, pumping espresso bars through to tuck shop mums almost like the, uh, was, yeah. how do you train? How do you build connection with, with people and try and get, get your passion across to them and to be able to get them to take coffee as seriously as what you did. So yeah, a great, re really enjoyable years that I spent a lot of years there with Spotless Catering and learned a lot about food standards, what we're catering, how to sat in with people when they were negotiating tenders and understood a lot more about the business side of things as well, rather than just working in a regular cafe where you're learning from mum and dad who are just mm. scraping through and trying to understand how to pay the staff and how to try to put a bit of money aside for Christmas holidays. Yep. It was nice to get that corporate view on coffee. Yeah. And I went away. I also I set up some cafes in other areas, consulted on a few. Ended up in Venice in Italy and helped wow. up in, uh, in Venice and spent some time in Italy and teaching Italians how to make coffee, uh, <laughs> which was, uh, which was a nice experience. And uh, yeah, then back and I wanted to get into coffee companies. So I wanted to understand a little bit more about roasting and how the, how the coffee developed or the, the, the journey of coffee before it got to the cafe. So trying to understand a little bit more about that and ended up with a company that was, when I was hired, it was called Ducali Coffee that changed its name to DC very, very close to as I was employed, where I worked in New South Wales and based in Sydney for DC Coffee for a few years, looked at did some, you know, training and sales for there. We set up a tasting room in, in King's Cross and it was a amazing to understand and really get driven by quality guys who were leaders in marketing and the, and creative out of the box thinking, which was, yeah, which is super, super great. We've still got a lot of friends through that business and, uh, and a lot of time and respect for th that company, the, not just the coffee, but also the way they, that they conduct themselves in the market training the, and also the, the culture that spread through that as well from having a brand that people believe in, they can really get behind and where, you know. When I was working there, the team, we were like family uh, mm. and it was, everyone was in for each other. Everyone would, we would do a trade show. We'd be the first there opening the, uh, opening the show first, first cafe, first stand that was open serving coffee. So when people were coming in to set up their own cafe, uh, their own little coffee stands, we'd be there making coffees for them, but we'd be the last one to close the roller door on the parties. So we, yeah. Hey, sure. Look, at night time, we were also being, so having a lot of fun with coffee as well and team come on, like real, yeah, like a family. So, so it was really cool. Uh, through times there. And then we ended up across with, with Coca Cola, who there was, there was Coke that grinders coffee called me for quite a few months, was just coming for an interview, have a chat. Anyway, finally I did. And at the time I wasn't, I wasn't thinking a lot about or thinking for, to work for Coca Cola at all or the, grinders coffee. I saw it as a big call for it that didn't care almost like that was my perception at the time. I ended up going and working there and having a, an amazing few years with grinders as well with the Coke network. It was a, it, we came in and we, in the time that I was there, the culture flipped, quality and standards changed and lifted dramatically. We got to make impacts. It was the social benefits from being there, the learnings you had from working for a big multinational. And, and also the role I ended up sitting in was this ambassador role, the coffee ambassador role, Coke. So it was a very, it was an interesting role where I, where I don't think anyone really knew what I did. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, the results were coming through, right? There was a lot of numbers, not only with the staff engagement scores, but also with the numbers with, 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 
with, with not only turnover profits and we, we engagement, everything was coming through start, like customer as well as staff engagement and that sort of thing. So I think a lot of people didn't, yeah, know what I did, but it's <laughs> like how we managed to work the team. We had a super engaged team. One of the, like, by the time I ended up leaving, we went from the lowest engagement rate in Coca-Cola history to the highest of the year in or one of the highest of the year. So wow. for the company, so it was within a couple of years. So we flipped it, changed it and uh, yeah, had a, had yeah, a lot of fun in the process. Yeah. It was great. But at the same time, I was uh, doing a little bit of work. Wife was doing a bit of work in Bali, just not work in Bali, but she was writing a book on Bali. So she'd come mm -hmm. over and see people earlier and yeah, she would, she had to spend a little bit of time. I had a young son at the time, just not long born when she started the book. And so I started doing a little bit of, a little bit of consulting on the side. And in Bali, understanding the market here and I, where else sitting in with Coke, I got some insights or where Coke, the company gave a lot of insights into different, different areas, different countries within the region and within the Amatil at the time, or Coke called Amatil at the time. Yep. In the, in the region and what was coming. So Indonesia, there was a lot of excitement and a lot of talk around the growth of the middle class, the the economy, how fast it's growing, what's going to be by 2025 and how it's, how their Indonesian locals are really loving quality, product, affordable luxuries, international brands, how they're getting accepted or about the love and the respect for local produce. And at the same time, I did some consulting, got involved, saw Bali, what it was, what the business side of things was like over here. And yeah, I thought it was the opportunity was at that time was then it was now it was, I can see that no one else was, we'll talk about with Coke, they'll be talking about it in a few years, what's happening in a few years, maybe do coffee in a few years. Things was quite, everything was a little bit more distant and there was, I didn't really see, I couldn't find any full service coffee companies at the time that were doing and, uh, yeah, or had an understanding and for farming tech or what was happening at origin because in Indonesia we are at origin we have we're in one of the one of the one of the first places that coffee actually landed so it's we we at origin origin so what was happening at origin right through to roasting QC understanding a whole development of coffee and all sort of thing through your customer service understand training and the benefits of training customers and wholesale how that all had to work companies that, that had a big brand presence that could feel like you were in a brand, had auditing processes for cafes, quality standards that were happening with customers, right through to pouring a nice cup of coffee at a cafe. So when I saw there was no one doing it, I was like, it's gotta be, it's gotta be soon. Everyone's gonna be doing it soon. And my son was young and there was all these talks and I just, I just done quite well in coffee and good spirits. And, and so at the time just was did the Australian competition, won the Australian competition, was heading off to, to China to compete in the world competition, started setting up the business in the background for, for expat roasters, started to get that a little bit more clear in my head, and, but wanted to very much still go to the worlds with Grinders Coffee, with Coca-Cola mm -hmm. products and out of respect for everything they did, how they were and what. The mission was I was trying to do there was very much to say that we could, you can be big and good, right? You don't right. Have, just because you're big doesn't mean you can't be good in, in service or training or quality of your product or whatever. So I wanted to very much showcase grinders and, and the products that helped support me in the journey. Some of the alcohol products that were through the amateur lines and stuff at the time. So I did quite well there, came forth in the world and then, then definitely celebrated with the team. Through <laughs> yeah, but then uh, then jumped over to Indonesia to set up to set up and get hands on in expat roasters. Wow, what an amazing journey! <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much for sharing the whole like the overview, quick from overview start, picture of from start, start to finish. <laughs> <laughs> but I can see how your vast experience, especially you going from mama and papa cafe smart to corporate smart, and learning both sides of the industry, had really given you the insight and the expertise. But also going deep down into branding as well as into the competitions and understanding product really well. And I've, I've always had a lot of admiration for people who give it a go overseas. Like I've always wanted to, to open something overseas as well. But the thing is, it's always a concern as well. It's, it's not your, it's not our backyard. It's a different ball game. 
and especially in Asia, it's a total different ball game. <laughs> and my family and people in the past have told me because my my background's Vietnamese, and they're like, "Kev, hey, you got to get back to Vietnam and open something in Vietnam, or go off." And I'm like, "I don't know. <laughs> I don't really have. I don't really have family over there. I don't know if I. I don't have anyone I can really trust there, and they could just take away my business at any point in time. It doesn't. It's pretty scary in that sense. But I've always wanted to do something overseas." Mm. And obviously, and Bali is just such a beautiful place. The people are beautiful and I've only been there in the recent time, but uh, like it's Indonesian coffee as a whole has just grown, blown up over the past couple of years so much. What did you see was the biggest difference between operating in, in Bali versus Australia? Ah, oh, well, it's okay. You can take it anywhere you like. <laughs> I think the jump from Australia to anywhere else in the world. That definitely has challenges, no matter where you go, there's cultural challenges, uh, there's, there, there's consumer behavior challenges, there's just challenges, uh, and different religions and how they play a part in, in, in consumer buying and, and also doing business and everything. And then there's different laws, different taxes, different, there's multiple challenges doing, do business anywhere outside of what your your comfort zone is, or uh, yeah. I think that Indonesia is no different to that. Bali is no different to that. It has those challenges. There's a lot of challenges every day in, in, in things that are just outside of what I've been used to or what I've grown up with, but there's also so many beautiful points to doing stuff overseas as well and to do stuff in different countries and the learning and the growth and those same challenges that you have, like how much they can benefit you in the future and how you can learn from learn from different cultures, learn from different religions. In Australia, we celebrate, we only really acknowledge one religion, right? In Indonesia, like, it's a public holiday for what, six, seven religions, right? So they're made for their major days and that sort of thing. So there's that, there's understanding culture and how they, how people eat, how they drink, what they do with families, where they live, what's in there, what's their, what their social behavior is like. When you get outside of your norm, you learn so much. And, and I think I'm blessed to be able to do this and to be able to work with Indonesian staff, to be able to have great friends over here and to have also a business that is, that is developed from a, a, quite a one, one dimensional mindset. When I came to trying to really understand a lot more about the world, uh, copy scene, what also is important in different areas. Yeah. So there's a lot of those things. There's a lot of global challenges, Bali as a whole, there's the benefits far outweigh the uh, negatives and such. These little things, we were running late to a meeting and then there's a road that's closed down because of a ceremony. When I first moved here, it was through these phases, right? When I first moved here, I was like, I'll stop and I'll be like, that is so beautiful. It's the most amazing thing. How, like they can close down the busiest roads in the, in this city to because of a, whatever religious reason. And that's just their priority. So yep. the, to, to to make sure that the ceremony happens and it doesn't matter about anything else. It's amazing that they can do, I don't know, give dates to birth and, and give offerings and things all day long to different elements and stuff. We had, that was one of the, one of the Hindu days for the like metal or something. And so the cars and everything all get dressed up. Like everyone puts these offerings and if they wow. the <laughs> to support our, the metal and the, so these things that you fall in love with when you first got here and then three or three years in, maybe you're playing two or three years in and when you're running late to meetings and all of a sudden, you're like there's a ceremony, it's a stop that you go, no, oh, it's a big customer. I need to be there. I need to be on like and stress. And then you, and then you like, okay. eventually you learn to just to accept it rather than it's not a, it's not something that's un, unusual or something to stop and to watch anymore. Uh, it's not something that necessarily frustrates you. It's just something that's just part of, that's just part of being here, right? So Shit. you just need to accept it and, and know when you get a little bit more aware, but you still can never know there could be a funeral or a, yeah. or something that's, you know, any sort of ceremony yeah. that's blocking the road. So you will never know, but it just is part of, part of doing business. And the, that's the way it is, but it's definitely like when you, and we talk about the life here as well, outside of work, you work, are you ever in the world today? You have to work hard. There's no easy way to succeed in business or to do anything right so you have to work hard but the thing i always say when i'm not working here i'm in bali yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, definite, it's okay to do a 10 hour day when you finish up and you have sunset on the beach or you know yeah. you have the family down you know you eat a beautiful dinner on the sand and wow 
come home to your dinner, be a little more stuff. So like, yeah, it's not that people work less hard, but it's definitely when you finish work that you're in Bali, which is, yeah. you know, which is a d- definite benefit. What a, yeah. It's a beautiful, that's a dream, man. <laughs> that's the dream. You know what it is? And it's also the sense of like, when I, when I arrive back in Bali, anytime I've been in Sydney or I've been in Melbourne or you know, anywhere else, Singapore, or around the whole, this year I've been in Europe and Dubai and wherever else, like the, this, you, I come back to Bali and there's this sense of freedom in Bali. There's a sense of, the, the, you've got the tropical elements with you know, running bikes and there's rice fields and there's, there's no real rules in so many ways. And so you have to create your own boundaries for your life. So the feeling of freedom here is like nothing else I've experienced anywhere else in the world. So when, when you do finish work after a long day, and it might be a bit stressful or whatever it is, and you get to, you get to jump on your bike and ride home through, across the rice fields and. Ah, uh, beautiful. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So missing Bali already. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. This is such an interesting place. I remember I was talking earlier, like I love the experience at expat coffee roasters when I went there with my partner and we like you guys had a security guard at the front door that helps you cross the bloody road. Like where in the world how's that for a cafe? <laughs> oh, that's Pak Suk is there, but he's, he's not the security guard as much as he's there as our first point of contact. And he's there as the last point of contact. And I think if, if you go there a few times, you'll realize that guy, like you're at a lot of places in Bali as well, people have this, he'll valet your car for you. He'll straighten up the bikes out the front. He'll make sure you get across the road safely. If you're crossing the road, he's there to welcome you. So at, you know, it's not necessarily like the security or it's more as the, I find Indonesia the safest place in the world, right? It's like so, super safe, touch wood. But so it's not for security at all, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's very much for just the first to make, to make your experience start and finish well. So yeah, yeah. when you come into the, if you come into the cafe, it's nice for someone to open, open, open the door for you and you'd be greeted you do before that what is before that so it's about making yeah. sure when you're parking that those roads are stressful in Bali they are like for people who aren't used to them if you're trying to pull your bike up or you're trying to like leave the cafe and it's busy roads is it nice for someone to stop the traffic for you and yeah. wish you well on the way out thank you for coming and thank that's uh, yeah yeah no the staff your staff are amazing he was amazing I just I just caught him a security guard because he was just this fit looking guy yeah. out front. It kind of looked like somebody was standing out outside King's Cross kind of thing, like a bit of a bouncer kind of vibe, but he was really sweet as they are. And your staff brewing the coffee were, they were, they're really into it. You can tell they were knowledgeable and they were, they're really serious about making coffee and they were trying to educate me on which coffees are which, what am I looking for? They're very attentive. It was a great experience. Um, one of the best among the world, that's for sure. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's all. Like, good. It's good yeah. to hear you. Room. I think we definitely, definitely look at trying to every, every day is looking at how we can do things better and what else you can do, but it's nice to get the feedback like that. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. And then a bunch of my staff were over there in Bali and they were like, oh, we're at, they were, they went, oh, we're at expat coffees as well. And they bought a whole bunch of coffees. They brought it back to Sydney and they were just cupping and having a bit of fun with each other. It's yes. awesome. It's a great awesome. experience. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Did you have a helping hand over there? Did you have people on the ground that you knew and trusted to help you set up expat? Yep. When I, when I started, I went into a partnership with a, with another Australian guy who already had a cafe here in Bali and he had an infrastructure or quite a lot of infrastructure already, which was invaluable at the time to mm. understand how to set up the business here. I wouldn't have been able to do it as well on my own or it would have taken longer for sure. So that, yeah, that was a. It was good to have that you know, experience of someone who'd already been there, done that. Yeah. But now I think there's also, there's a lot of groups and a lot of the business owners in Bali who are definitely open to sharing their experience, open to sharing contacts and things like that around setting up a company. It's not as daunting now as what it was six or seven years ago. I think anyway, that's how it feels to me. I think well, maybe it's just that I wasn't. Maybe I'll be a little bit more in touch with business owners here now than when I was, but, but I feel like there's a nice community here of people who are, yeah, who are open to, if someone asks me, oh, you got 10 minutes to quick, have a quick chat about setting up business. Yeah, no worries. What do you use? Uh, like these are legals, accounting, whatever, like practice you need to like tax, whatever, use numbers, working visas, how to get foreign working visas or whatever. Yep. Here you go. Wow. Not, they're the numbers we use. It's not, it's not like hiding. Uh, yep. I, and I think most, 
I don't know, at least I don't know, 10 people I know he would be super open to doing that. So it's not, that's not great as, to know. Not as hard as, what, not hard, as hard as what it was. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear that it's such a open network over there that are open to helping as well. Yeah. One thing I've always been curious about over there in Asia in particular is that the numbers always make sense to me mm-hmm. in terms of the costs and the financials and stuff. And correct me if I'm wrong, but like over there for specialty coffee, you're pretty much charging the same prices or if not more than what Australians are paying for coffee here as one. But your overheads over there should be a lot lower in terms of the wages are generally lower. The I don't, I don't know about the rent in the cities, but I guess it depends on the city that you're in. But it makes the cafe seem a lot more sustainable over there than it is in Australia. Like Sydney, it's right prices, rent is high. Your wages are through the roof. It's increasing again and again. Yep. We already have racist margins and that it's how do we survive? Hard. And it's hard. Yes, yeah, it's so difficult, man. Hard. It's very and, hard to be successful in, in, in hospitality in Australia currently like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. I've been slacking it out for yeah, seven, eight years and it's freaking hard, man. People tell me going off and they're like, oh, yeah, it's amazing. You're so brave to do stuff overseas or whatever. I'm like, are oh, you brave to open a cafe in Sydney right now? We're up against a lot of good operators with super slim margins, like, but the numbers, the volume is there in Australia, which is the difference. And I think mm. that what people don't, what people don't take into account is that is the, the, in a cafe scene in Australia is one of the most advanced in the world, right? Yep. And people, people buy, they consume in Australia, like at, for, at that price point where in most places in the world, specialty copy. You won't get specialty coffee bars that are doing the volumes anywhere near the volumes that, that we do in Australia, where I think that, I think in Indonesia, a cafe is doing 10 kilos a week in, in a premium or coffee cafe or whatever. That's reasonably good. That's quite good. Oh, really? It's not, it's not, and then, and when you go to the lower end, so when you go in like iced coffee, so all the like cheap, like dollar fifteen mm. coffees, yeah, you can do more volume there because you've got a huge market. In a place like Indonesia, you can do it. But when you're when you're sitting at four dollars plus for a small coffee, for a six ounce coffee, your 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 market is there's a market. There's and everyone's doing okay, but it's not the numbers aren't there like they are in Australia. You don't have you don't have a lot of cafes doing thirty kilos of coffee a week. That's for sure. Mm. Very, I could count them on one hand. Yep, yep. It's a it's a diff, it's a different market of volume sort of there. So you don't have the same overheads. So you. You don't have, generally don't have the same volume either. Volume, sir. Yeah. So. Understood. But you well, that's a misconception. You, yeah. And you say margins are like a good, but some of your costs, if you're using a lot of the premium products here or imported products, they're taxed crazy. So it's expensive to land olive oil, butters, like a basic, get these sorts of products in you know, a milk. It's expensive here and it's not good to get good quality milk. It's expensive and it's still not as good as what you get for sale. What, a dollar a liter or whatever it is, coals. Like, yeah. It's, 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 there's a lot of things that are more, machinery has always been a lot more expensive. We've always paid a lot more for equipment for the venues, but then things like the fit out costs, cement is cheap. It's the tip to a cafe that I use a lot of cement in the cafe, but it's, and I do it for branding and for the look and feel of it and all sort of stuff. Like if you compare the numbers to, to Australia to do the same thing, it's, it's cheap to do that sort of stuff here. So it's, it's just. Where you find your, where you find your numbers, where you find your margins and where you position yourself in the market. Yeah. Yeah. Give or take here and there. It's just different yeah. space, different things. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And how did, obviously Bali is a, a tourist destination and it's a whole tourism based country. When COVID hit, like how badly did that impact you guys? <laughs> yeah. Cause everyone, like when I was there, they were like, oh man, it just went dead quiet. Right. Yeah, and that, I, that would have been tougher. Yeah, so it was, Bar- Bali turned into a, like a scene from a, a country in Western Rudy when you could see the people coming in the distance, the hay bales rolling down the street sort of thing. Like it was a, it was, it was heartbreaking to watch. It was heartbreaking to see impact on families, communities. There was a lot of people when we, and we were blessed as a company. We stayed open. We kept all staff employed. We, we kept grocery open and running the cafes open and running. It's it. 
to wet whatever the government would allow us to do and in whatever space they would allow us to do it, the takeaways or whatever. But not many people can say that, that they're as lucky as us, but we, I still spoke to my staff and I had one-on-ones with every staff member and not long after COVID hit and just saying to them like April or May. And so I talked to them and to say, number one, how are you? How are you? Like, how are you? How is your family? How is everyone in your community? But then also how many people are you supporting on your salary? Which averaged out at about eight and a half people per person wow. they were supporting. And, and then also, do you have any ideas or see anything in the local market or in anything you think we can do right to change our strategy to try and help us get through this together? Yeah. But I had, but the, the, I think the fact that they, that they were supporting so many people that it just showed that there was, there's just no one working, mate. No one, no one had, it's it just an island completely reliant on tourism just shut down and then it started just popping up in trend room spaces. So the Indonesian domestic travel started coming back and then it did with a a very trend driven. So it was like 2019 or 2018, 2019, it was like lonely traveler rated Chengdu was one of the best destinations and whatever it was, right? The Chengdu was just on the map as the cool place to go and the fun place to go. So some areas around Chengdu, they survived through through either long-term stays people that were trying to escape cities and yeah. lockdowns or whatever that were, or, or were already here that just bunkered down other people that, that somehow got in or it was from the domestic tourism that that, that came that was would fly from jakarta or surabaya or Medan or from georgia that come into to bali for their holiday and to especially the travelers that couldn't go to singapore or australia or europe or America or anything mm-hmm. for their holidays, they were all just holidaying in Bali. And a lot of them also would run businesses because it would work from home. They decided to just take a villa because you'd get a, a villa monthly, paid monthly, and you'd get it quite cheap because people just wanted to rent them out until tourism came back for a short term stays at that time. Like everyone was discounting quite a lot. So people from Jakarta ended up coming to Bali and staying. So they'd go to Chengdu and they would get, so areas like that came back first and that was very, that was good to see that there was something happening and there was definitely a, a the domestic tourism kept Bali alive and kept the heart beating at least. And that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm glad you, you made it through and yeah, it's safe on the other side. Uh, it, it was a tough time for so many people. But um, if you, I think if you, when you, if you rode down the street, the main streets of the, say, Seminyak, Kuda or Legian or. And you go through and there's just roller doors yeah. and there's no dogs sleeping in the middle of the road because right? there's no cars. I just, it, it was something else that yeah. it was straight out of a movie. There was yeah. no one would, no one would have ever thought this could happen like this. I think value bombings, yeah. things shut down, but it was a shorter time. It was, there was a little bit of tension for a while. Volcanoes, I've opened up, had volcanoes in, in Bali, you know, tsunamis in Indonesia. We've had, there's been like, and then with COVID, we've, We've had a very hard six years in, in this sort of way, but, but nothing's been, I don't think anything will ever compare to COVID in the way of that. But. Wow. Yeah. And is it a back in full swing, like 80%, 100% back for you guys now in terms of tourism or people coming yeah, back? The, the numbers coming through the airport are around 50% still. International tourist visas coming through. China hasn't opened up, so that's probably, I think that's around 30% that was... Chinese tourism anyway coming through yeah mm-hmm. uh, around 50 percent but that's yeah but it's a good 50 percent yeah it's a great traveler coming back they're people that yep. are really excited to be traveling again people who are wanting to get out and experience things people who are jumping on the, the experience bandwagon for sure they're coming coming over here all in like it's a drink great coffees eat great food do you know cool things do an you know, outdoors beach mountains, uh, there, yoga, there, everything, there's a lot going on for people and there's, and people are definitely coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Full I speed. think, uh, I think Australia recently released a visa to work in Bali and tax free or something like that. So everyone's trying to jump on that bandwagon as well. <laughs> now, what does that actually mean? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, what? Work from Bali? Yeah. Tax free? <laughs> I want in. <laughs> I don't think it's as good as, I don't, anyway, come to Bali, it's good. We're waiting for you, but <laughs> I don't think it's quite as good as tax free. I think it's more that you don't have to pay double tax. So I think if you, yeah. 
And normally if you've got a, a working visa or some sort of business visa for Bali for long-term stays, I think then you'd have to pay an Indonesian tax as well as the Australian tax of some sort. So I'm not 100% sure in how it all works, but that's what I think it's maybe not. Yeah, it doesn't make sense that the tax free. Somebody's going to make money. <laughs> Someone, <laughs> that's, a nice, that's a nice theory in life to live to have to be tax free, but I don't think that's a real reality. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges that in operating a business out of Bali or a challenge, one of the biggest challenges you're facing right now? Uh, challenges that we're facing. So I think we've touched on quite like challenges of Bali, COVID, things like COVID happened, okay. Bali shuts down. So we had to look very closely at what our market was, who we take. So, you know, our, the biggest part of our business is wholesale. So roasting and wholesale coffee. So how do we, we were quite Bali centric, but how do we open ourselves then more to the rest of Indonesia? So what other markets are there? Should we be doing more white label or contract roasting? So we were doing a little bit already, but what are the other markets and how can we get into that? Is there, if we're, if it's not an expat roasters brand of product, how do we help people, no matter what the level or the quality of coffee, how do we make sure that they do that level better? So even if it is one of the, like the iced coffee chains, we would be, we were very open to roasting working alongside or partnering with someone to do that style of thing and working on how to do it better we looked at i was back in you know in australia and i saw the brand everyone going into supermarkets all of a sudden i saw that was the uh, it was the trend for a premium yeah. specialty anyone everyone was trying there was if you went to the uh, to woolworths or coles or if you went to one of the uh, their offices you'd generally see a coffee company sitting down waiting for a uh, one of the premium or specialty coffee companies waiting for a meeting there was, a, so we looked at what were the supermarket area for, and what that, that looks like in Indonesia. It's not quite, it's definitely not what we were expecting it to be, but it's still, it was something which we, we definitely tried. Yeah. So we had to, but by doing all those different things and looking outside of our normal business practices, we now at 50% international tourism back. And Bali, we're doing, we're, we're still substantially better off as a business in most ways because of that time. Although something like COVID was a challenge and was, we did April, 2020, we did 7% revenue year on year. It's 2019, like seven. Then you yeah. <laughs> right there. I, was like, I imagine the panic yeah. and the, the, what was happening. And we, I was lucky enough that we sort of saw it coming and we had some plans in place already and good friends in New York and everything that just said to me, if it's, if it's happening, if it's happening in your friend, it's going to happen in Bali, just be prepared, get your, yeah. get your, all your eggs in, in, in line and lots of stuff. So we, anyway, we, yeah, challenges for Bali, definitely things like that. Volcanoes have just about shut us down before. COVID's just about shut us down again. Natural or uh, disasters or pandemics or anything are definitely scary part of doing business here. Things like general challenges of every day to day on challenges or different business challenges on trying to get someone to build a, a, something for you and, but it's a religious holiday and for the next week, you can't get anyone to get to do it. So it's just, and I think that when we, in Australia, we have that a little bit at Christmas, but in Bali, you get it at Christmas, you get it for like Ramadan Eid, pay that sort of, <laughs> the holiday. you get it for the Hindu holiday, it's <laughs> pretty the further from Chinese New Year, it's a public holiday. <laughs> It's, it's very much like that. Uh, there's a few challenges on that, which is also amazing and beautiful, which makes you think like, why don't we respect, why don't we acknowledge all religions? Like, and it doesn't make sense to me around the world now where you're going, what? When I say to, to Indonesian people that Australia or most countries only have one religion that they acknowledge, that it's like, what do you mean? It doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. And there's so many religions. <laughs> Oh, no, this is the same thing. Anyway, yeah. anyways, challenge, the challenge is every day, right? And what you do, right? It doesn't matter about yeah. somewhere, but it's about how you overcome them, right? How you deal with them, how you face them, what you can benefit from and, and learn. And it's pretty cliche to say all those type of things, but it's, it's quite true. Even with my staff, I'm always do it. If you think it's right to do it. And then if you know, if it's with a bad move, then learn from it. I won't be angry. Learn from it. Yeah. But don't do it again. Yeah. There's no big day. Michael, Michael, second, third chance. I'm like, second chance, no worries. Let's do it. If you aren't learning 
or you're doing the same mistake over again. There's no education anymore. That's, mm. that's, yeah, that's, you've got to, yeah. got to be learning for all these things. So every child has the same as the whole, the road closes for how do you learn from it? How do you understand it? How do you adapt or do you just have to accept it as part of what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. It's my, it's my partner was working in Singapore for a period of time. And the same thing, right? She's, oh, I'm on a, another holiday, public holiday. It's this day off and it's that day. I'm like, you're always taking time off for all these holidays in Australia. She goes, oh no, but in Australia you get longer periods like Easter and stuff. So it feels like we get it twice a year. All right. Yeah. That's too bad. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we're so multicultural in Australia. I, you're right. It's like, why not? We've got all different religions in Australia, which is such a big spike here too. <laughs> Seriously, in Australia, there's, because when you talk about cultures and inter integrated cultures and stuff like that, like Australia's amazing. And you talk about Vietnamese, some of the Vietnamese food in Sydney or in Melbourne or like, you'll rival food in Vietnam. Like, Vietnam, yeah. Like, like a lot of foods from around the world. Like my wife's Lebanese background, we're the most amazing. Lebanese food and what you like, the Italian food is great, or Greek food is the, it's the cultures are integrated with food and with society and with, with friendship groups, with schooling, with like, it's very, it, it's very, but when it comes down to religion, everyone I think is accepting enough these days, like it's definitely not as bad as what it used to be in Australia with, in, in a lot of ways, but they, when it's, when it comes from a, like a government level, just what will we acknowledge? It's not, yeah, I don't know. I've actually got, in my company though, we've actually taken out all, all public holidays and said, that, <laughs> right. so we say, so public holidays are a thing, right? And, but there's also a, there's also, there's, there, so you've got ho your regular holidays plus public holidays. If you work on a public holiday, for whatever reason, you get a day in lieu or a, mm. an extra day off somewhere that you can take as where, so we just say that we don't acknowledge public holidays. But if you want to take the, your day off on a public holiday, please take it off. That's that, then it's amazing. If you want to take that day off, that's great. And a lot of people decide to take public holidays off because they have other friends and family taking that day off as well to celebrate with them. Mm -hmm. But we have no expectations that offices will close down or roastery will close down or cafes will close down on any public holiday. And that it's generally people's choice to, to take the day off or not. And, yeah. and if they would prefer to take. If they're Christian and they want to take a golf at at Christmas and so they can spend time with their family around their most important time for their religion, then or should they only just have the one or two days public holidays then why don't they take they, they don't need it at Ramadan and for Eid and for for his birthday, whatever, like any of the other Muslim yeah. holidays of the year. Or they don't need it for Chinese New Year or they don't need it for so take it and use it when you want. So that's the Yeah. I think that's a fair call. <laughs> I I, again, it's one of those things where I'm like, I don't understand. Why do we force people to take a day off for what I believe? It doesn't really make sense. I want to take Christmas off. Right? Take time off for Christmas. Why is that? Because yeah. my family will take time off for Christmas and my friends will take time off for Christmas. So I want to take time off then to celebrate and to enjoy time with them, right? It doesn't make sense to me why, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I'm, I'm back around and we're in Australia. We just work every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> what public holiday? Oh, it's China. It's, it's Christmas. Oh, it's time to make money. <laughs> Everyone else is closed. We open. <laughs> what? You guys are closed, Issa? We open. <laughs> I feel like I've got a little bit of that. My business, where I'm like, I, oh, my business, I'm from a bit more of a business owner thing. <laughs> Try and see opportunities and everything. It's just, I don't understand why we would close down for a public holiday. It's like, really staff that don't want to take a public holiday. Why, why would we close? Exactly. Capitalize on that time where it's actually yeah. busy. That's yes, right. Because you, you, it is busy. Everyone else is closed. They come to, it's like, why not, man? Why exactly. not? Exactly. Look, I love, but as long as, you take, as long as you're taking time off at some point, and I think that's where a lot of immigrants have been sought. And, and I think people that are really trying to build a light in a country and there for a long time, like they get in and start to grow out grassroots and try and push hard for a lot of years to be able to do it. So they, but yeah, but as long as you're taking time for yourself and you need to, you still need time and it still need time off. You still need to have recharge. some down yeah. time to recharge. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Mate, curious question. What's it like bringing up a family in Bali? This is it something you'd recommend. Is it something you're. I don't know. I just have dreams of 
starting a family possibly in Bali as well one day. Just curious to hear your opinion. Definitely. I bringing up a family away from your extended family is extremely hard. So there's, there's a lot of benefits to doing it. So no doubt we've got, we're, we're lucky enough here that we've, I don't have to do the, the mundane sort of, I don't have to do the day-to-day -day things in the house or wash clothes or, so when I'm not at work, I'm spending time with my family and my friends. So there's no, I don't have to come home and like do the deep clean on the Saturday where we will clean the toilets and clean the, change the sheets and do the, I don't have to do any of that. So the benefits of bringing up a family in Bali are very much that you, you've got time for, for your kids. And when you're with them, you're with them. I also have, there's times where we've, we've got an amazing nanny who's like our family and we can, we, if I've had a stressful day, rather than me coming home, being stressed, trying to put the kids to bed, them playing up, me yelling at them, my wife then yelling at me for overreacting and yelling at them. And then everyone got a bit angry and then wake up in the morning at six thirty, at six o'clock in the morning, they come and jump on me and I'm still angry from the night four at <laughs> where here, I have a stressful day. I ring up my wife and I say, it's okay to get the day to put the kids to bed tonight. And we go out and have a, a, you know, a reflexology, a bottle the wine, a chick meal, and mm. go home smiling and happy. And the kids jump on me at 6 a.m. in the morning and I have a wrestle and a laugh with the kids. So yeah. the benefit of where I've never been able to experience that sort of thing in Australia where you can just do that as much. And because actually have to try to find a babysitter, try to find, well, is your mum available or is it oh, it's too late, late minute? She probably hasn't organized anything and then trying to organize dinner and it's harder in Australia for those type of to be able to be spontaneous, to be able to think about yourself and, but also then what will be better for your family, right? So it's better for me to be able to, I know that it's better that if I, do, if I, if I have, have a dinner, if I spend $20 on dinner and a bottle of wine and, and then have yeah. a mixology for $10, you just think like the way, the benefit of that is worth millions. So yeah. in Australia, where it's, it's trying to get a nanny and trying to get a babysitter or trying to get anyone that's stressed for it as well. And there's trying to do everything last minute and to try and then the cost involved and there's, so bring up family barley, there's positives. There's at the end of the day, family is important and extended family is important and it's hard. FaceTime do, doesn't cut it. Yeah. FaceTime, it, grandma on, on FaceTime isn't the same as. Yeah. Getting a hug from grandma. Yeah. Guess you just have to fly back more often. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing, mate. So we really try to make the best of it in the way of when people come, people come here and we get intense time with them. If my parents come here, for instance, they're staying in our house with no extra distractions and they will have a week or a month or whatever it is full on with our kids in, so in like in with their kids like it's yeah there's no other distractions for them. there's nothing else they need to do the only thing is do we go out for dinner or do we stay in like it's they don't have to work they don't have to do anything they, they don't have pressures of any other sorts or any other commitments so it's like in and when we go back to australia hmm. we generally stay with people most of the time whether it's my in-laws or whatever it is where we can just you know have that time there when they finish work yeah. We're there for dinner every night and we're there and we're like, they have that intense time with them, which is amazing as well. I think that if we were living in the next suburb, say my parents might come, yeah, say twice a year, three times a year, we might go back there a couple of times, whatever it is, but just say they come twice a year and they have two weeks every time. So you've got a month of every day. So it's quite a test where if you're living in the next suburb, I don't know whether you would get 30 days a year. <laughs> no way. <laughs> You get that intense time with each other and breakfast, lunch, dinner sort of time. I think mm. everyone's like is into your life and, but it's still, there's, there's in between times when you haven't seen her for a while and you do get to miss yeah. them. Like, you are missing them. That's yeah. true. It's caught me on a time where I am missing my family, mate. So it's, yeah. uh, it's also the challenges and the benefits all yeah. intertwined. I understand. Man, we're just getting towards the tail end of our conversation, getting it to wrap up. Just. Maybe one or two more questions and then we can finish it up. Yeah. I don't know um, if you're in coffee. We haven't, we haven't spoken about coffee the whole time, have we? This is a podcast. This is the one about my family. This is the one about my family. All right, here comes the coffee question. 
<laughs> now it begins. No, 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 no. Now it actually begins. I'm cheering. I'm cheering now. I'm cheering coffee. No, I thought it off. I absolutely Oh, uh, yeah. This is the beauty of it, man. Like, absolutely. Yeah, it's about a conversation, right? And that's the other thing about us guys who, who are in the coffee game. Yeah. So many, so much more than to the whole game than just coffee. Like, coffee is just one element of it. I really. So. I so. Yeah. Good. And so, Expansion plans. What are you looking forward to? What are you excited about? How are you thinking of making it bigger and better if you are? And I'm sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah, we, we've, so through COVID, one of the things that we looked at as well was housing and what we could do. We used to, we've always got a lot of interest from around the world and people that want to do things with us, whether it's a guest blend for a weekend somewhere in a cafe and wherever or whether someone's looking to franchise a cafe or to do something with a cafe or whether it's looking to roast in, in, in cafes. I think we, our branding is quite strong. We use a lot of tins. We've got great sustainability programs. We've got amazing HR policies that we can take to look to take around wherever we go. And the, so how do we, how, how do we honor that and grow? through that time we always held back if they would contact us and would say do you want to do something oh okay we'll talk but it's very hard to say because it was it's, your brand is like your baby right <laughs> it's, yeah that's it it's very hard to let go and to try and think if someone else is going to do it so we've worked quite hard on our buzzing agreements and what we can do with that and so if we want to franchise and we find right the right partners we we are now just about set up We've got a company in Australia who we've partnered with called Franchise Ready, who have come in and helped us because we've signed one quite large franchise anyway. We, we were doing in Surabaya, which is the very close to Bali, in, so in Java, uh, very close to Bali. Do that, and then we're looking to see if there are great partners or people who are the same mindset and well, that want to produce great coffee, but also have a, the culture and the, the workplace that we all want to be part of. So we're ready to go with franchising. We've had some conversations already this year, very preliminary sort of conversations, but we've had conversations with a few people around the world, had a few trips around to have chats with people about what's happening in different markets in different areas around the world. So I'd love to be, I'd love to do more countries. I'd love to be able to have the brand as a truly international accepted and, and enjoyed brand. Yeah. So yeah, so we've had some conversations. We'll see what happens. We don't, there's nothing signed off, nothing agreed on, but there's different talks. We've got Surabaya opening up early next year, which will be a beautiful big cafe. We're going, we're, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, it's going to be, yeah, it's a beautiful design and they've got great partners over there that we're looking forward to, to opening with. So trial it all there, see how the, the licensing and franchising works. I've looked at. Last week I was in Jakarta and for the coffee expo over in Jakarta, but also met up with quite a few, a number of people over there and there's some nice opportunities for, for early next year, possibly, but also some longer term stuff that might be, might be interesting and fun. So there's that. We need to expand our roastery now and how we, how we grow the, our infrastructure. We definitely need to, we definitely need to, to increase there, grow there. We've got a couple of roasters going all day, every day at the moment. So we need to wow. expand, but where, how do we, what equipment do we buy? What sort of facility that we go for? Like how big facility do we merge everything into one where we have offices, training centers, cafes, everything all in one, or do we still keep everything separate? Like what we've got currently. So yeah, so there's some really fun stuff there, but I think we'll definitely have some, a number of cafe, like number of additional cafes this time next year running that we in Indonesia. And I think that there's a, a good chance that we'll be have agreements next year for other places in the world as well. I think there's the Middle East is exciting. I think other parts of Asia are super exciting. Yeah. We'll definitely continue the conversations and make sure that we're, yeah, we're looking into, but also growing, but growing healthfully and growing as, 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 uh, as the best we can to be able to maintain culture quality, consistency in, in our messaging, in our quality, in our, in our, the, the product, the taste, everything. Yeah. We haven't been so a lot going on, but a lot, it's a fun, exciting time. Well, it's, 
Yeah, exciting times ahead, buddy. Man, I'm rooting for you. I, like, I, your branding is spot on, eh? You've, you've got really good branding. Yeah. I'm not sure, yeah, was it your idea in total or you got people to help you out, but far out, it's really good. <laughs> we worked we worked with great branding agencies when we first started, Melbourne-based agencies when we started, and then we developed internally as well. So I've got a great marketing team that we look at our sustainability aspects on everything, whether it's, you know, how do we reuse tin and like different materials. So we've got hey, yeah, and our packaging and that sort of thing. What are we doing with our recycling, upcycling? Ch- ch- how do we reduce our waste? What's the programs we've got in place for that? And then what are the materials we can use in that? And then how does the brand sit on that? So for instance, we, when we looked at the, when we look at branding or packaging or whatever we're doing, we try to see how, what are the elements, how it will win. And so something like when we, I think I bought maybe, I don't know, maybe 10,000 bags or something, right? It was just a, it was a number like a while, like years ago. And I thought this bag never break down. Like how, what am I doing? What is the, and what happens when I'm big? What happens when I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm small now? So what happens when I'm actually a big roaster and I'm putting millions of these things into, like, how do people sleep at night knowing that they're putting yeah. this out into, and that it, they won't break down? Like, it's just, so anyway, so we looked into different ways of doing it. So we found different packaging. So we've got two kilo tins that we do pick up drop off services, which now has evolved to, we've worked with community gardens, we've worked with soap manufacturers, we're working with other people with you now looking into ways of making renewable energies and products and things with coffee waste. And so we're looking, so we're trying, trialing a program currently where we pick up coffee waste as well in those tins. So we bring back not only an empty tin, mm. we bring back the coffee waste from venues as well and how we can do more with that and eliminate waste and things. But also those tins, when you put them on the shelf, cause they're two kilo tins, they sit perfectly where a bag would almost sit normally. And so that, that people line them up in their cafes and it's an impact. It's a, I think some of the big tins we use in Australia and all bags and things like that, it's not impactful as much where. I think when you, when you walk into a store that's using our product and they've got the tins all lined up in the store, it's a branding execution without, uh, without actually us putting that front of mind. It was a sustainability play, but ended up being yeah. a real branding play because of the, we're using strong logos, strong brand. We, we can, yeah. Yeah. We're quite, Man. yeah, we're quite lucky in how it's evolved and how it is evolving constantly and what we're doing with the brand, but we, yeah. Yeah. That's a great thing that you're on. Sustainability is something we have to look at. I remember when I was a couple of, like a few years ago, I had this, I think when I was like 31 and then I just had this epiphany. It's like, I think I need to be more conscious about what I'm doing yeah. as a small business, even as myself, I started to get more conscious about recycling and waste and all these things. And then I thought, you know what, I've got a little cafe, but there's actually a lot of waste there. I should try to do the right thing and went down a bit more down that rabbit hole. And the more deep I went down that rabbit hole, the more things that I saw was like, it was just like, it was a dead end in, in most ways. And then it's, you're trying to recycle, trying to do the right thing and you're paying more for recycling here and it all ends up in the same place. And you're like, like, it's crazy. I wanted to get more recycling bins and try to do the right thing. And the company, I won't say the name of the company, and it caused me, hey, Kev, it'd be cheaper if you just went and got another general recycling, right? Like a general bin pickup. And I go, yeah, I know that, but I want to do the right thing and split everything up and put more in the recycling. They go, it's all going to the same place, Kev. (laughs) This is coming from the company. I'm Um, thinking, geez, trying to do the right thing and you can't even do the right thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it just have to be a lot more creative. And that's why earlier this year, I started up this other thing with some friends about looking into just basically raising funds and looking into investing into green startups that can move the needle because it's just like the initiatives that you're doing like tins pickups like you're doing it out of yourself no one else is doing that there's no service around Mm. that's doing that like you have to do it yourself and i think that's the same thing here so if we want to make a difference we have to do it ourselves because you can't rely on these services to to do it for you because they're not everyone's out, out there trying to like Anyone truly trying to make an impact is trying to do it themselves because mm. the infrastructure is not there. Yep. I think the lucky thing is, mate, if you become conscious when you're small, then it's easy to grow when that's part of your, when that's part of your DNA, right? That, when that's part of your, 
And it's do it in one little cafe. The next thing you've got two or three cafes, bigger cafes, more food driven cafes, then you've already got the practices. You've already got the, the systems, the processes, you've got everything ready to, to expand anyway. That if you went to try and, if you want to try and buy tins for some of the big roasters in Australia and you go, it's going to cost whatever, $10 to 10, right? Whatever the number is, right? And you go, oh my gosh, we're putting out seven ton of coffee a week. And you just divide these areas. I've got three and a half ton, three and a half thousand tools that I need to buy. And then I need to buy, and then I need to have, so if there's one in the cafe, there needs to be one in transit, there's to be one on the, the stock on the shop, and there's one in the thing. So I've got to buy five to one or whatever it is. So I've got three and a half thousand times five that I've got to buy as my upfront. And then I've got to have, if we've got grow or think things get damaged or whatever it is. So say I've got to buy six to one. And you go, yeah. I've got three and a half thousand times six times ten dollars you're like i'm out but when you're smaller and you can go and when you go okay so if i start and i just started bali and i would just my customers in bali and how i can roll and i'm doing 500 kilos or something a week which means like 250 which means like 200 so times 10 and i do it times six that i can if we can manage it quicker because we've got more guys on the road we can maybe cut it down to five and it's yeah. manageable but when you're big and you're trying to put these practices in the place, then it's expensive and it's hard and it's, it has a big impact on your business where I think it's easier to be able to advise yeah. to anyone starting out is to try and get it in from day one, sustainability practices, culture in, in, within your business, try and make sure that the culture's right. Have, look at, yeah. look at what you can do with SAR, look at other ways that you can, not just about salary. Sometimes it's also about, about what yeah, you do. Absolutely. It days, it days you out, take everyone out for a day, close down the business. We'll take everyone out for a day through staff. We've got counseling services with our business. We have staff days. We do all that sort of stuff where it's like, this is good for, this is good for people. It's be better for people than a couple of extra dollars per week. It's, I think that a lot of that can be more, more impactful for them. Anyway, um, yeah, but if you do it, when you do it, when you're this small, it doesn't like to close down cafe, to close down, when you've got a small cafe, to close that down for one day, it's not that bad, right? But I'd take your staff out for a day. And, but when you've got, a business with 3,000 staff and you know, tr trying to close down for a day, then it's hard. But if it's in your DNA, it's in your DNA. But... Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's very good advice. You start small and just keep that through it running mm. as you grow. Yep. Mate, I'm really excited for your expansion plans. I'm thinking of, I've been planning my business partner to go down that chain route as well, like franchising. And we've got our second store now. We're hoping to get our third, fourth, and then from there, build a franchise model out and then go from there i'm excited because it's a whole new experience yeah. managing a little small cafe to sorry and then to two spaces and then so now you've got like 40 50 staff and then imagine like a chain it's the logistical challenge time management challenge the people management challenge like all of those things i'm i have no idea <laughs> but i'm excited to learn that piece and see where it'll take us on this journey i think Absolutely. I think as well, I think it also makes you look into your deeper into your business, right? So when you start to, when you have to try and document everything, it makes you look like, what is, what is the system? But what are our processes here? How do we react to that? What's the brand, I don't know, the stand or what, now, what service styles and yeah, it makes you look into once you start, when you're going out from like you being the operator or to other people running it and being able to step away, it makes you have to look at every detail, which is pretty confronting in at times, but also it's because when you realize, because you realize yeah. a lot of the time you realize that there's so much you don't have. What is it that we, so what, I don't know, down to simple things, simple, small things. And you go, oh, wow, that's just common sense to do that. Why would I need to document it? Because, <laughs> because you've been in the industry for 10 years or whatever, it's, it just feels like it should be common sense, but it's not. So you have to look into these mm. yeah. all details yeah yeah mate i want to respect your time thank you so much for jumping on i really appreciate the conversation i had lots of fun i talked about a whole range of things not just a couple of coffee that, yeah, that's, <laughs> but but we, i think we, that's we, the beauty about speaking we do also sell coffee if anyone's listening so we like, well, we'll, we'll, we'll work with farmers all around indonesia <laughs> <laughs> But I think that's the beautiful thing about between cafe owner to cafe owner. It's that other people come in, they just hone in on all parts of the business and then that's it. Yeah. Whereas from an operator to another operator, so I was like, mate, so much more to it. Yeah. <laughs>
It's not necessarily about the origin you're pouring as your, as your, yeah, as your, fil- exactly. as your filter for the week. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Maybe one day we could do a round two even, catch up and see how things have gone oh, as, see, as you expand and go, okay, now you're in 50 different cities around the world. How's oh, it going? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, that would be it'd be amazing, amazing to have that, that conversation then. But if not next time you're in Bali, definitely jump in and we can uh, yeah have so, a copy if not a uh, not a another session. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Again, thank you so much. Appreciate your time, buddy. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's it for this week's episode of Brood Awakenings. If you enjoyed what you heard, please leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to tune in next month for more steaming hot coffee talk. Thanks for listening.